So, who are the ideal patients for tier? Because I'll limit it to tier since this is a tier session and then we have a TMVR session. And uh, it is tier mostly because we have coronary sinus annuloplasty, direct annuloplasty and coronary replacement, but really the majority of the interventions when it comes to transcatheter repair is tier, right? And we have the MitroClip that is now 21 years out and we have the Pascal. And initially, this was our data, the Everest trial. So we wanted to meet the Everest criteria. But the Everest criteria are no longer contemporary. We almost never look at it. Um, but before we go into the technical aspects, let's, let's see about which patients benefit from that. And the only really positive trial that we have, massively positive, of course, is the COAP trial that at five years it shows consistent benefit in this population of functional mantra regurgitation, poor LVs, um, and, you know, it, it is quite consistent in terms of death or hospitalization. Of course, quite a few people died after five years, but these were patients with severe MR and severe heart failure. Uh, but it has been incorporated in the guidelines. The recommendation now is uh, higher compared to surgery. Uh, isolated mitral surgery. Mitral surgery has never shown any benefit in this population. So I think um, when it comes to patient selection in terms of clinical criteria, any ejection fraction between 20 and 50 percent, and systolic diameter less than 70, and systolic pulmonary pressure less than 70 millimeters of mercury, these are the patients that will benefit from tear. And they are highly recommended, both in the uh, US and European guidelines. Uh, exactly the same. And um, uh, we can be quite happy and proud that we completed the Reshape HF2 trial. I'm looking at the year, uh, colleagues and friends. It will be presented in ESC and it, hopefully it will be published simultaneously at the same time. So we've been there. We did a lot of work for this trial. Let's uh, hear it out. It's a different population though. Uh, less MR, a little bit, uh, slightly bigger LVs, so it will be quite interesting to see what this trial will show in terms of patient selection. But um, it works. I mean, this is a patient 11 years later with dilated cardiomyopathy that survived to take additional heart failure medication. So when we did this uh, procedure, uh, there was no ARNIS, there were no SGLT2. Now the patient is alive and had the benefit of these therapies, and he's still doing well. Um, and this is the residual MR after 11 years. And we have, of course, bigger sizes, and that has enabled us to extend, um, the, to expand the criteria. This is the expand G4 study that shows now that uh, if, we, if you put the bar to one plus or less residual MR, you're actually doing quite well. In the functional cases, you get um, up to 95% at one year. In the uh, degenerative cases, almost 90%, a bit less. But if you go to the more difficult cases, that proportion goes a little bit down. You can see what we mean difficult cases. So when you're looking at lateral or medial jet, more than one jet, sl slightly smaller valves, some calcium, calcium is, is an enemy of tear most of the times. If you have a coaptation length that is uh, less than two millimeters in the functional cases, or if you have big widths and big gaps, that was the initial exclusion with Everest, but we're doing it, of course, with, the, with lower chances of success. Still quite high success rate, but we're doing it. And if you compare, if you put this into pro perspective, COAP trial gave you uh, one plus or less residual MR 67% and was still positive very positive, expand G4 now gives you this proportionate above 90% most, most of the cases. With safety, safety is very, very important. Um, and of course, all-cause mortality in this expand G4 population has been lower than the co-op population. Of course, it has been a different population. And we have more uh, devices. Pascal is here and is working and has been used for some time. We have Dragonfly coming from China, Gemini One maybe. So more tier devices will come into the market with additional features. Some of them will be useful, some of them will not be useful, but we'll have to see. So where are we now in terms of uh, selection criteria? We have the straightforward green patients, we have the prohibitive red patients, and we have the in-between patients. 
And the green patients are the central pathologies with mitral area more than four square centimeters with minimal calcification and with enough fabric to grasp. So posterior leaflet length of more than 10, tending height less than 10. These are the traditional Everest uh, criteria. And you can see what I'm talking about. These are the patients that you expect to get one plus or less in more than a residual MR in more than 95% of the cases, in less than 5% of the uh, cases to have more than one plus MR. And we have the yellow patients, so commissural jet, multiple jets, a little smaller valves on the other hand, shorter leaflets, posterior leaflets, tending height more, width more in terms of prolapse. These are the yellow zones that we have variable results depending on the expertise of the center, depending on the individual parameters. And of course, we have the red light. The red light is, you know, Carpentier 3A. So patients with rheumatic components or MAC with the mitral area less than 3.5 with a lot of calcium, especially in the grasping zone and inadequate posterior left. We still do some of these cases because we cannot do anything else for these patients. Surgery is prohibitive. TMVR is still investigational. So, you know, you have to do something about these patients, but you're set up for potential complications. I mean, I wouldn't dare to do, uh, for example, the patient on the top left corner. I think whatever device you put in, it's quite likely you will end up with stenosis. And we do see that whenever we extend our grasp into yellow or red zones, our success rate goes down. You can see that here in the complex versus non-complex, the acute procedural success was significantly less, still high enough, but significantly less, and also the potential for um, residual MR. And um, that the same went to, uh, to be seen in the Pascal uh, 2D uh, results recently, that uh, although Pascal achieved very good results in terms of MR dis di di reduction in the main cohort, uh, in the difficult cohort, the results were not as good. So we've come a long way achieving incredible results with MTR and MitroClip has been a game changer generally, pushing the boundaries of the therapy. However, the more complex the anatomy, the less successful the results. That's 100% uh, uh, sure. And right now, the complex anatomy are being attempted due to the lack of alternative transcatheter therapies. And hopefully, this is the time for TMBR to step in and cover this unmet clinical need. Thank you very much for your attention. Vlasis, congratulations, a beautiful uh, presentation and overview. Uh, I just would like to comment uh, about the uh, patients on the uh, right side of the spectrum of uh, eligibility. Uh, we um, occasionally will try to help them uh, with edge to edge, but we need to understand the limits of this therapy. And it's not for everyone. It's, a, it's one tool, we, what we try to apply it, but it's not for everybody. So we're really looking forward to uh, valve replacement therapies that are coming up uh, in the near future. So. That's absolutely true, and one thing we always have to remember is if you put a device in there, uh, then your future options are limited because you cannot replace the valve if you have a device. If the surgeons intervene, they cannot repair the valve in case that the valve should have been repaired because usually you have enough tissue that they cannot repair. So it's a lifetime management consideration, especially as we move on to younger populations. Uh, so thank you once uh, again for your excellent contribution, Vlasis. A practical question, especially with the scenario of functional MR, how would you judge, uh, ideally, the importance of functional regurgitation? Would you be based upon echo criteria alone, or would you proceed with the right cuff? Um, ECHO is very important in terms of technical eligibility and clinical eligibility. You've seen the guidelines is the mainstay of patient selection. I always do right heart cath in my patients because it gives you an idea of the physiology. Sometimes you get surprised. Uh, you find discrepancies in the pulmonary uh, hypertension, for example. Sometimes with the ECHO you overestimate and you get a, a better um, uh, idea of the patient um, uh, when you do right heart cath. On the other hand, you also uh, have the opportunity to evaluate the cardiac uh, output, the cardiac index, and you know that you can draw a line in terms of futility in some of these cases, for example. 
Um, and it's a hard team decision, so I think the hard team has to take all these parameters into consideration, clinical parameters, heart failure perspectives, echo parameters, as well as hemodynamic parameters. Glass. Uh, I make, I'm sorry, I make this point because uh, quite often, um, especially in functional MR, during the intervention, we are skeptical about the outcome of the intervention itself. Once we had the previous hemodynamic data, it would be much more easy eh, to compare the effect of our intervention just on time. Agree. Glasses, congratulations uh, uh, for your excellent talk. Uh, it's, uh, you are a connoisseur of uh, the method and uh, of the methods for uh, uh, relieving the, the mitral regurgitation. And uh, I would be more practical and uh, ask uh, what, what knowledge should we disseminate to the private doctors or the, or the secondary hospitals or the tertiary hospitals that do not have the facilities for the TR? Uh, the TR therapies. Uh, what are the simple methods that we will we have to disseminate to them for patient referral? I think once you see significant mitral regurgitation of any etiology, investigate further. Let's start with that. So don't sit on it. Say, okay, we can use some diuretics, especially in the functional cohort. Medical therapy and CRT therapy is the mainstay of treatment. It should be optimized before getting into leaflet therapy or any other device therapy. However, if you sit too long on that, the patient may miss the boat, and then it might be too late to do anything. So have a low threshold of referring the patient to a center with expertise for further assessment, and then have an open communication. I think that's the key, in my opinion. So the, uh, there's need for... Uh, for networks. Uh, Absolutely. Heart failure is and, network. Uh, and, uh, heart failure is, is a network, but management. we need the uh, networking for that. Uh, even even we rely uh, on private sector uh, sometimes. Uh, the, the, the two most uh, uh, profound uh, uh, centers for this are uh, private in our country, but uh, we should uh, overcome hurdles uh, of uh, health system, our health system, and uh, disseminate the knowledge, and, dis and uh, disseminate the therapy, and uh, to more recipients. Agree. Okay. Okay. We have concluded the session.